Hello and welcome to this beginning of a series of first look exploring sessions diving into uh, court masks, specifically the court masks of Ben Johnson. Now, we have already done one Ben Johnson mask uh, from much further down the line, uh, 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 his uh, Christmas mask. Uh, which we did at Christmas because it was Christmas and we couldn't find very much to do at Christmas. Uh, but uh, we thought we'd do something a little more systematic. Now, normally with our exploring sessions, we generally try to keep a sort of sense of an arrow of time by starting with the earliest kind of text available. And, and even though we dance around a bit, we sort of move forward. Uh, by starting with Ben Johnson's masks uh, and, uh, and masks from the 17th century, we've sort of quietly ignored everything that's going before it. Um, partly because 17th century mask does do quite different things to earlier masks. The term mask in, say, the 16th century is a much more amorphous term uh, and is used in quite a different way to what happens when James I comes to the court. Because what happens when James I turns up is, A, they spend a lot more money. A lot more money. And uh, and the kinds of texts and the kind of performances that they're, they're producing uh, do do undergo uh, quite significant shifts. So in a sense, this is a really good place to be starting. And it's also a terrible place to be starting uh, with with these particular texts. With all of that in mind, we're going to dive into in a moment the first uh, two of Ben Johnson's masks, uh, the Mask of Blackness and the Mask of Beauty, both of which texts it would be important to point out now are quite problematic. Uh, the, the Mask of Blackness and the Mask of Beauty uh, come together effectively as a set and they are going to highlight uh, the various problems that court masks bring up, uh, specifically uh, privilege uh, to do with wealth, obscene amounts of wealth, but also privilege to do with race and, uh, and other problems that are going to be uh, thrown up. So uh, just tri content warning here, this, this is going to be quite racist um, and quite, quite quite problematic and normally for first look exploring sessions we're asking the question of how would we perform this how would we put this on today how will we make this accessible to the public in in a wider world uh wider way for this exercise this is much more about just understanding what's going on at the court understanding context understanding the context that will also then feed into plays that are similarly problematic from around this time um we might look at these masks and present things about these masks but they're more likely to be more on the documentary side of things rather than full productions and the other reason why we wouldn't do full productions is because they're fantastically expensive. Um, the budget for these masks are somewhere in the region of four thousand pounds in in early modern money. So if you if you know a friendly, slightly racist oligarch, we we, <laughs> we you know this 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 text is open. Uh, but um, otherwise, no, not happening. So um, with all that hopefully uh, lined up uh, in mind, we're going to now tentatively read through these first two texts uh, and again uh, just for clarity uh, mask is not my area uh, various people in the room uh, uh, know spy uh, uh, no I believe more than I do so hopefully I'm going to be pushing other people to the front to uh, to uh, uh, come up with opinions and thoughts I have done a modicum of research uh, to hopefully keep everything moving forward and I have got access to some notes and footnotes uh, from these texts um, but uh, we are at this stage primarily co collecting questions and trying not to present uh, incorrect uh, data uh, as we find out uh, uh, tentatively what's going on here. So joining us to read through the text today, uh, introducing themselves. Emily, introduce yourself to the, to the world, please. Yes, hello. I'm Emily C.A. Snyder, an actor, playwright, and podcaster in New York City. And Helen, introduce yourself, please. Hello, I'm Helen Good. I'm a historian, and I'm currently in Hull. Uh, Eric, introduce yourself, please. Hi, I'm Eric, and my laptop is resting on the Conquest of Gaul, and my mic is resting on the Game of Thrones. So, I mean, it's a pretty good day. <laughs> uh, Lois, introduce yourself, please. Uh, hello, I'm Lois Potter. I'm early modern. I don't, I don't, I wasn't born quite that far back, but I'm a retired academic in London. Uh, Alexandra, introduce yourself, please. Uh, hi, my name is Alexandra. I was born that far back, uh, or even further. Um, I'm here for the racism. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be one of those sessions. Uh, uh, Elizabeth, um, introduce yourself, please. 
Hello, my name is Elizabeth Amisu and I am based in Romford. I'm an author. I'm also here for the racism, unusually. Uh, Alan, introduce yourself. I'm in Suffolk and no books have been harmed in the use of this computer. Uh, and uh, we ha also have uh, various people lurking behind the scenes who may be uh, throwing comments at us that we may mention as we go along uh, and, and uh, we'll see where we go. I'm your host, Robert Crichton, um, and uh, I say I'm just going to try and uh, keep this uh, moving forward. So let's start at uh, the, uh, the, the, the Mask of Blackness. Uh, it's personated at the court at Whitehall. On the 12th night, 1605. Now, we have got some additional materials that I will deep into later uh, uh, describing this event. Uh, but this is uh, this is the material coming from Ben Johnson himself. Uh, there are also uh, some notes that John Ben Johnson adds to this that uh, I'll filter through, uh, which gives us an idea of what people thought at the time some of these things meant. But uh, the text opens with an awful lot of description. Uh, a certain amount of throat clearing uh, 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 of stuff that uh, you, you can't, for the most part, see. Though, uh, if you uh, do an image search online, you should be able to find at least one image, I think, from this uh, this particular mask. But I cannot display it on screen at this time. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, Lois to read the first paragraph and Alan to read the next paragraph, uh, which I, I say I'm going to describe primarily as throat clearing from the author. The honour and splendour of these spectacles was such in the performance as, could those hours have lasted, this of mine, now, had been a most unprofitable work. But when it is the fate even of the greatest and most absolute births to need and borrow a life of posterity, little had been done to the study of magnificence in these if presently with the rage of the people who as a part of greatness are privileged by custom to deface their carcasses, the spirits had also perished. In duty, therefore, to that majesty who gave them their authority and grace, and no less than the most royal of predecessors deserves eminent celebration for these solemnities, I add this later hand, to redeem them as well from ignorance as envy, two common evils, the one of censure, the other of oblivion. Pliny, Solinus, Ptolemy, and the, of late Leo the African, remember unto us a river in Ethiopia, famous by the name of Niger, of the which the people were called Negrite, now Negroes, and are the blackest nation of the world. This river taketh spring out of a certain lake eastward, and after a long race falleth into the western ocean. Hence, because it was Her Majesty's will to have them black moors at first, the invention was derived by me and presented thus. And we'll just pause there before we actually get descriptions of the thing itself. So Ben Johnson, <coughs> very much talking about uh, after the fact uh, in uh, in the opening uh, text of. Uh, uh, about um, you know the, the, this this presentation, um, and uh, and then a brief mention of of shall we say the sources uh, Pliny etc. Um, that uh, the the material that uh, maybe uh, uh, he's drawing on. Any thoughts on the room at this stage, Lois? Well, just one sort of explanation. There's that whole bit about the people uh, as a part of greatness are privileged by custom to deface their carcasses. What this meant was that I think right after uh, the banquet and the mosque and everything, uh, the crowd just descended on the banquet table and pretty much wrecked it. Uh, and I think that's what he's talking about. I mean, the carcasses. Uh, so he doesn't want the spirit of this thing to die along with the, the body. Mm, yes, and we do actually have uh, that. I'll, I'll be reading uh, uh, that a little later on. Uh, so some of the the context of the original performance. Uh, yeah, some things went a bit wrong, uh, shall we say? <laughs> yeah. um, though it could be exaggerated by for effect. Helen. Yeah, I'm glad I had Lois's explanation of that because I'd assumed it meant that after the meal they all went out and got tattoos. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, that first paragraph reminds me very much of a camera manual I'm struggling with. It seems to be in English, but I don't understand a word of it. Yeah, 
it, it, he's laying it on a bit thick there, isn't he? Um, but he's, he's, it is possible. It should be possible to write in clear sentences, but it, there are so many parentheses and so many absolutes and, oh dear. Yeah. No, I, 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 I'd like an English translation. <laughs> well, welcome to prose of the 17th century. Uh, Alan. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean, the one blessed relief is at least there's no damn Latin in it so far. Ah, well, but, actually, um, there was, but I didn't give it to you. So right, in, in but, one version says a little bit of Ovid. Uh, I, I mean, I'm just top. wondering whether the printer had actually run out of full stops and was just using commas because he'd happened to have got an excess of them. No, that's um, that's just I mean the, that's just the norm. That's the, just fo the norm. The fog index of those of those two paragraphs would be incredibly high. Hmm. Oh, the second paragraph's all right. Hmm. Well, because it's a bit of geography. I mean, the geography is rubbish, hmm. but it's good. I mean, it, <laughs> you can understand it. I mean, there is no river that runs from Ethiopia into the Atlantic. I don't think is there. It's a question uh, we can answer. Um, I'm sure someone can either Google that or someone in the comments can tell us. There are um, on opposite sides of a, of a massive continent. No. <laughs> well, that was what I thought. Mm. It's rather like early modern history. They didn't know much about that either. Well, I, oh, they I, I knew really a wouldn't lot, but I'm, it just wasn't right. Yeah, I really wouldn't trust mostly Pliny. mostly travel narratives. On, yeah, I really wouldn't trust Pliny on pretty much anything, actually. Mm. Leo Africanus as well was pretty dodgy. Oh yeah, and and in in very slightly in fairness to um to the the people of that time, um the names of places did change uh, and and or peoples did migrate. They're not necessarily where we are placing them now. Mm. Uh, yes, so the note I've got on Leo Africanus uh, uh, wrote the uh, description of Africa in fifteen twenty six. So uh, you know is. Uh, not quite a hundred years old at this point of uh, of, of, of working from, <coughs> but uh, it's like a little closer than Pliny. Uh, yeah. Lois. Yeah, just to say, I really enjoyed reading that first paragraph. Um, <laughs> I like 17th century prose. I mean, so I think it's what they call the Ciceronian style, where uh, you know everything is very elaborately worked out grammatically, and you can actually, if you take the trouble, work out a whole uh, grammatical uh, what do they call it diagramming of it, but. Uh, um, yeah, you know, he must have taken real pleasure in working that out. What he's trying to create, I think, is a kind of dreamlike atmosphere. I mean, I think one of his other masks actually says near the end that the pity was it lasted not always. I mean, everybody was in a sort of dream while it was going on. And, you know, if only one could preserve this this state. Uh, yeah, excellent. Right. We, we should. Have, oh, uh, Elizabeth. Yeah, I wanted to just discuss briefly um, the line where it says, hence, because it was Her Majesty's will to have them black moors at first. And the invention was derived by me and presented thus. I always wanted to say that um, the, the, the mask of blackness is kind of steeped in novelty. It was the earliest mask to display a white royal as a black person for which there is an existing text. So it's not necessarily the first one ever, but it's the first one for which there is an existing text. Um, Johnson's first court mask, as well as his first in conjunction with designer Inigo Jones. Most importantly, um, it was the first recorded use of blackening to actually darken the skin of the royal maskers. I wanted to just focus on the fact that it was Queen Anne who commissioned the text, um, written in 1605, and just the sense that it would have been performed at the palace at Whitehall um in 1605 on january the 6th all of this has in his um in his apocrypha um but just the sense i just thought there's the sense of the grandness of the text and the grandness of the mask and how many people would have been there um i know the spanish ambassador had some other things to say i know dudley didn't like it carlton didn't had didn't like the text at all but the spanish ambassador had um a different opinion. So I thought we should also mention that when we mentioned Dudley, because it wasn't everyone that hated it. 
Mm, yeah, um, we do. We have we have a, a selection of uh, responses to it, uh, but in, in different ways. And yes, I, I, Elizabeth's point about uh, uh, who's commissioning this uh, this mask. It's not all coming from James. There are there are effectively rival courts within the court. Uh, both his his wife and also his son uh, will be commissioning uh, entertainments like this. So there's complicated politics going on uh, around that. Um, Alan, yeah, I was just wondering what. I'm sure I knew at some point where Anne actually hailed from because I was thinking that the tradition of uh, coloured people within the Spanish court was fairly well established, I think, by this point, but I'm not sure where she hailed from. Uh, 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 Anna of Denmark. Hmm. Right. Okay. The Anna yeah. police will come round and throw bricks through your window if you call her Anne. It's Anna of Denmark, yeah. Unfortunately, yep. yes, but everyone calls her Anne, so I think we probably should. But I'm just warning you, the Anna police are vicious. Eight, one and six, mm. after James. Uh, right, let's let's find out what's going on in the text itself. Let's uh, start getting some description of the event. Uh, Alexandra, if I could ask you to read the first uh, uh, quite long paragraph. Uh, Elizabeth, could I ask you to read the next three relatively short paragraphs, and then we'll pause briefly, and then we'll uh, we'll pick up again. So, uh, Alexandra, first, what happens? First, for the scene, was drawn a landscape consisting of small woods and here and there a void place filled with hunting moors, which falling, an artificial sea was seen to shoot forth as if it flowed to the land, raised with waves which seemed to move, and in some places the billows to break, as imitating that orderly disorder which is common in nature. In front of this sea were placed six tritons in moving and sprightly actions, their upper parts human, save that their hairs were blue, as partaking of the sea colour. The dissonant parts fish, mounted above their heads, and all variant in, varied in disposition. From their backs were borne out certain light pieces of taffeta, as if carried by the wind, and their music made out of wreathed shells. Behind these, a pair of sea maids for song were as conspicuously seated, between which two great seahorses, as big as the life, put forth themselves, the one mounting aloft and writhing his head from the other, which seemed to sink forward, so intended for variation, and that the figure behind might come off better. Upon their backs, Oceanus and Niger were advanced. Oceanus presented in an human form, the color of his flesh blue and shadowed with a robe of sea green, his head gray and adorned and horned as he is described by the ancients, his beard of the like mixed color. He was garlanded with alga or sea grass and in his hand a trident. Niger in form and color of an Ethiop, his hair and rare beard curled, shadowed with a blue and bright mantle, his front, neck and wrists adorned with pearl and crowned with an artificial wreath of cane and paper rush. These induced the maskers, which were 12 nymphs, Negroes and the daughters of Niger, attended by so many of the Oceanii, which were their light bearers. And we'll just briefly pause there to just take apart some of what's going on here. So we've uh, we've got seahorses. Uh, anyone who's been with us for uh, Lord Mayor shows will will know uh, the, the 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 delights uh, we can sometimes have with uh, random uh, people riding uh, animals. Um, and uh, we've got some some interesting costume uh, detail here uh, coming out. Uh, thoughts from the room. Anyone wants to, to take apart that uh, that description um, uh, for for uh, for what's going on here because I say this this is the problem is we have to sort of figure out what the description sometimes means and whether we're clear as to what's what's actually going on there um so uh Lois and then oh, just the, that little thing which falling in the second line uh I mean that means that there was a, a sort of curtain with a landscape on it and then it was it dropped curtains usually dropped rather than rising and uh 
And then you got the next scene, which was the artificial sea, which was the much more elaborate thing, which uh, you can still see machinery that does this kind of thing, rolling waves and so on in some old theatres. Yeah, uh, that's a good point about the curtain. Uh, the later stages will will have uh, slightly better uh, mechanics for for doing things with curtains. But it, yeah, it seems at this that the curtain is in place and then drops. Um, that that seems to be the mechanics of it. Uh, Elizabeth. Yeah, in its opening lines, the text which celebrates Britain's difference from distant darker worlds presents the character of Niger as fair. And I think that it's really important that he's also presented as the son to great Oceanus. So we have Oceanus, um, who is the embodiment of like the world seas. Um, and then obviously we have Niger's 12 princess daughters, which were played by Queen Anna of Denmark and her ladies. Um, and they're referred to as the, his beauteous race. And I loved the description, his beauteous race, because it's rare in early modern literature to see ne ne Negroes or black people described as a beauteous race. Um, I think that their arrival at Whitehall is um, kind of sw swarming with cultural anxieties. I think it could have made the audience very uncomfortable to see these painted beauties arrive on arrive um, in in the in the mask. I think that it would have um, had a lot of anxieties to do with gender and race. I think we shouldn't underestimate the gender the gendered nature of the text as well as the race elements that could have been quite anxiety. Driven, driven for the audience. Hmm. Uh, other thoughts, uh, Lois, and then we'll collect some more data. Yeah, right. Yeah, I think the idea that this this is very much a female mask, Lady uh, Queen Anne and her ladies, Anna, and uh, um, and it's kind of an offering to the king. I think at this these relatively early years of James's reign. Uh, Sometimes it's sort of like that, you know, uh, regal masks, not that James ever danced in them, uh, but masks uh, offered to the queen, masks offered to the king, and this is kind of a tribute to him. Yeah, I think, I mean, we haven't really discussed why uh, Queen Anna decided that it would be great for them all to appear uh, as black women. And I think that's really interesting. The trouble is one of the theories for it is one that I can't really discuss here, I think, but it's got to do with the play that was put on at court most recently. Mm. Uh, yes, we, 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 we will dance around that problem uh, in a moment. Helen, then Elizabeth. Uh, I've been scooting through Bacon's essays because I was sure he had something to say on this, and he does. Um, the colours that show best by candlelight are white, carnation, and a kind of seawater green. So there you go. But fine embroidery is lost. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Elizabeth. Yeah. Um, just speaking to what Helen just said, and um, I think the costuming of the characters is really important and is really, really vibrant. And I think indicative of almost the opulence of James the First court. But speaking to what Lois was saying about um, presenting to the king and queen, um, I know that the text was entered in the Stationers' Register in 1608, that was April 21st, and it was published in quarto in the same year by Thomas Thorpe under the title The Characters of Two Royal Masks, the One of Blackness, the Other of Beauty. And a scribal copy signed by Johnson exists at the British Library. And, it's, and it was really one of the most exciting moments for me when I was like, be allowed to touch it. It allowed me to to take it out. It was I had to get special permission from my um, tutor Sonia Masai, Professor Sonia Masai, to get even near it. Um, and in it, it's signed by Johnson, and um, its presence among the royal manuscripts indicates that it might have been presented to the queen, king or queen. Um, it was definitely included in two folio collections of Johnson's work in later, later decades. Um, but the main thing that I thought about it was that it was very interesting that it was published because it was kind of bringing the world of the mask to the masses. 
And I thought that that was interesting for people who weren't able to attend the mask to get a sense of it, to get to almost um, to take a bite of courtly life. Mm. Uh, Alexandra. And then I, Eric. Yeah, I just have a question as to because presumably this was only ever performed the once. So I have a question as to who would have been the audience for this, um, as in how many people would have actually had the chance to see it? Because as Elizabeth says, you know, putting this in writing brings it to other people. Um, and you need these descriptions, these very detailed descriptions, because it is um, it's spectacular. It's 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 a you know imagine uh, the the visuals of of what is being described. It's a great theatrically speaking. It's a great visual start, you know. Oceanus uh, with the color of his flesh, his flesh being blue, and you know d adorned with algae and and all this um, this magical th this amazing stuff about um, the the very it's the very first image that we're seeing with seahorses and all sorts so um i'm just thinking from a from an artistic standpoint it's a really spectacular start and also a very i guess in, intended as a very exotic um, um presentation so yeah does anybody have more information on who would have who this would have been designed to impress it's an excellent question uh lois well, the court, obviously, <clears throat> foreign ambassadors. Um, I mean, uh, James was very well aware of the importance of public spectacle, and uh, uh, especially if you're receiving a lot of people from abroad. And uh, the court, I think, became much more international under James, in fact, than it had been uh, under Elizabeth. Um, so it was partly that, and partly because uh, there would have been a lot of people there that didn't know English. And so, in fact, the visual was much more important than the verbal anyway. I think it's also got to do with the the change in drama to more classical subjects as opposed to things from English history, which would have been totally incomprehensible to, to foreigners. So it was partly that. I mean, getting into a mosque at all was, uh, was quite a, uh, a job. I mean, if you, if you wanted to see the thing and didn't have an official position. I think in um, The Maid's Tragedy, there's a scene where, where somebody's having a lot of trouble bringing a woman into the mosque, I mean, getting, getting her into it. Uh, and uh, I seem to remember reading somebody who said that he he never bothered going to the mosques, but he usually found a way of getting in and looking at the scenery beforehand, and that was the best bit anyway. Uh, and uh, but you know, I think it, it was very competitive, and I believe where people were seated, I mean, where they were in relation to the the, the throne, which had the one really good viewpoint, uh, was also very significant. I mean, if you were way on the side, and you know, if you've seen these diagrams of theaters, you were probably getting a very partial view and gazing into the wings a lot of the time. In fact. Mm. Uh, uh, Emily, I will come to Eric in a moment. Um, um, well, is Eric going to answer that? Because I've got a slight diversion. So no. no. Okay. <laughs> um, this is absolutely not my area of expertise. Um, masks, I mean. Uh, but at the same time, I'm I'm so delighted thinking that some of the language, particularly in the um, in the explanation of what. Uh, that that long paragraph of why the seahorses <laughs> look the way they do where is it um e yeah that one of the heads seemed to sink forward so intended for variation that the figure behind might come better off and i can only imagine N nigo as he's drawing this up and explaining why the two seahorses look different you know because you know invariably someone said well shouldn't they be symmetrical he's like no, let me let me explain the stagecraft i am inventing um to you right now um, and then just as a, as a document um, to, to be able to imagine what he created since, since we don't have photographs and we don't have video and, and whatnot. Um, so that, that delights me to no end. The other thing that I'm thinking, though, is, um, well, the first two paragraphs do seem absolutely, uh, particularly that first paragraph, seems Johnson uh, covering his uh, derriere shall we say, um, the honor and splendor of these spectacles, such as in performance, <laughs> you know, and then ending saying, you know, that we're going to save it from censure or oblivion. Um, but but uh, what's striking me is something that has persisted into casting now, 
um, which is, so for example, I work in New York City. Um, we worked with uh, very diverse casts. And um, I remember after uh, there was like a festival of short, um, a certain verse playwright person scenes. And um, and my my producing partner, who is Latina, turned to me and just sighed. I was like, okay, you know, like, did they do, <laughs> you know, like, you know, it was a fine scene. What are you upset about? And he was like, I am just so tired of always being magical. I am so tired of always being asked to be the other. Even though I get fantastic costumes, I am other. And I'm sick of it. And we're never going to do that, right? And I'm like, yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> Um, but, but you see that here, that the sort of only way you can kind of sneak it in is to, to, um, celebrate, but celebrate in otherness, um, which, which is just something that's still being worked against now, I think. Um, although yes, I am glad to see that, that there's an element of the beauty, the light taffeta, um, and so on. So I'm, those are things that are rattling around in my mind. <laughs> Mm, uh, they're good things, uh, Eric. And then we will we will gather more data uh, from from the text. My question is basically like, well, because obviously it's not just the visual. There's clearly music, but like there's music made out of breathed shells, and there's a part of me going, "What on earth is that about?" Because um, obviously I, I don't know if there's any sheet music around from this particular mask or this time. So yeah. Uh, the music was by Alfonso Ferrabosco. Uh, I don't think we have music specifically for this one. We do have music for some masks. Um, as I say, we, we sometimes have uh, 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 quite detailed uh, uh, stage uh, imagery and, and sketches for some of them. I think we've got something uh, for this, but I don't think we, we necessarily have a lot. Um, so the, 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 there is a whole mix of sources that, that needs to go into this. This is Ben Johnson's take of what we get um but to say other others we will get uh, we will get more and that's one of the problems of trying to pass a text like this is because we've got primarily text for something that is not necessarily that interested in text um which is why it's almost impossible to properly uh, reconstruct uh elizabeth did you want to jump in before we uh, we read more yeah <clears throat> just speaking <clears throat> to what was just spoken about i just wanted to mention anu cornahan who made an argument that to whites, black skin looked exotic and erotic, and it produced mixed pleasures of the senses. And I just wanted to talk, um, just to briefly mention the kind of erotic nature of the text, that that's there as well. Um, and I'm not sure how that would have been received. I think that erotic nature of the text might have been contributing to Carleton's mislike of it. Mm. Yes, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, and we were uh, mentioning Niger. Niger is the principal river in West Africa. Um, and lots of like things like wood and oil along the roots of the river Niger um, get their name from it. I am uh, Nigerian. So from Niger, we get the, the country Nigeria as well. But um, Niger was in common use as a word from 1600 onwards, but it has a lot of different meanings. It comes from the Spanish for black. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, Eric, did I go back to you earlier? I said I was going to, I can't remember if I did. Did I? Yeah, you did. Uh, oh, cool. uh, I asked about the, the shells and the music. Oh, yes, excellent. Uh, right, let's uh, let's get uh, a little more of the description, and then uh, and then we'll actually go into some song and dialogue, actually, uh, which is uh, the, the the bulk of things. So we're going to read uh, continually for a little bit. To uh, to uh, I say we've we've not really read very much, and we've 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 possibly leapt ahead in some of our thinking uh, in terms of what actually is going on. So I'll ask Helen to read the next paragraph, the maskers. Emily, the paragraph after on the sides of the shell. Eric to follow there. Uh, Lois, uh, if I could ask you to read the next two paragraphs that follow there for the light bearers, sea green and the one after, I will fill in. Uh, Alan, if I could ask you to do the song. Uh, uh, Emily, if I could ask you to read Oceanus. Uh, Helen, if you could be Niger. 
and uh, we'll move some stuff around uh, after that. Uh, so a reasonable amount. If you're confused, uh, just I'll, I'll, I'll say your name so that you get to prompt you. But it's Helen, Emily, Eric, Lois initially. The maskers were placed in a great concave shell like mother of pearl, curiously made to move on those waters and rise with the billow. The top thereof was struck with a chevron of lights which indented to the proportion of the shell, struck a glorious beam upon them as they were seated, one above another, so that they were all seen, but in an extravagant order. On the sides of the shell did swim six huge sea monsters, varied in their shapes and dispositions, bearing on their backs the twelve torchbearers, who were planted there in several graces, so as the backs of some were seen, some in purple or side, others in face, and all having their lights burning out of whelks or murex shells. The, the attire of maskers was alike in all without difference, the colors azure and silver, but returned on the top with the scroll and antique dressing of feathers and jewels interlaced with ropes of pearl. And for the front, ear, neck, and wrists, the ornament of the most choice and orient pearl, best setting off from the black. For the light bearers, sea green, waved about the skirts with gold and silver, their hair loose and flowing, garlanded with sea grass and that stuck with branches of coral. These thus presented, the scene behind seemed a vast sea, and united with this that flowed forth from the termination or horizon of which being the level of the state, which was placed in the upper end of the hall, was drawn by the lines of prospective, the whole work shooting downwards from the eye, which decorum made it more conspicuous and caught the eye afar off with a wandering beauty, to which was added an obscure and cloudy night piece that made the whole set off. So much for the bodily part, which was of Master Inigo Jones's design and act. And by this, one of the tritons with the two sea maids began to sing to the others loud music, their voices being a tenor and two trebles. So there follows a song, which Alan doesn't have to sing, and then some dialogue uh, uh, form uh, stuff after that. Be very relieved to know I will not attempt singing. Sound, sound aloud, the welcome of the Orient flood into the west. Fair Niger, son to great Oceanus, now honoured thus, with all his beauteous race, who, though but black in face, yet are they bright, and full of life and light, to prove that beauty best, which not the colour but the feature, assures unto the creature. Be silent. Now the ceremony's done, and Niger say how comes it, lovely son, that thou the Ethiop's river so far east art seen to fall to the extremest west of me, the king of floods, Oceanus, and in my empire's heart salute me thus. My ceaseless current now amazed stands to see thy labor through so many lands, Mix thy fresh billow with my breakish stream, and in this sweetness stretch thy diadem to these far distant and unequalled skies, this squared circle of celestial bodies. Divine Oceanus, tis not strange at all that since the immortal souls of creatures mortal mix with their bodies, yet reserve forever a power of separation. I should sever my fresh streams from thy brackish, like things fixed, though with thy powerful saltness thus far mixed. Virtue, though chained to earth, will still live free, and hell itself must yield to industry. But what's the end of thy Herculean labours, extended to these calm and blessed shores? To do a kind and careful father's part, in satisfying every pensive heart of these my daughters, my most loved birth, 
who, though they were the first formed dames of earth, and in whose sparkling and refulgent eyes the glorious sun did still delight to rise, though he, the best judge and most formal cause of all dames' beauties, in their firm hue draws signs of his ferventest love, and thereby shows that in their black the perfectest beauty grows. Since the fixed color of their curled hair, which is the highest grace of dames most fair, no cares, no age can change, or there display the fearful tincture of abhorred gray. Since death herself, being pale and blue, can never alter their most faithful hue, all which are arguments to prove how far their beauties conquer in great beauty's war. And more, how near divinity they be that stand from passion or decay so free. Yet, since the fabulous voices of some few, poor brain-sick men styled poets here with you, have with such envy of their graces sung, the painted beauties other empires sprung, letting their loose, their winged fictions fly to infect all climates, yea, our purity, as one of Phaeton that fired the world, and that before his heedless flames were hurled about the globe, the Ethiopes were as fair as other dames. Now black, with black despair, and in respect of their complexions changed, as each where since for luckless creatures ranged, which when my daughters heard, as women are most jealous of their beauties, fear and care possess them whole, yea, and believing them, they wept such ceaseless tears into my stream, that it hath thus far o'erflowed his shore to seek them patience who have since ere more, as the sun riseth, charged his burning throne, with volleys of revilings cause he shone on their scorched cheeks, with such intemperate fires, as other dames made queens of all desires, to frustrate which strange error oft I sought, though most in vain against a settled thought as women's are, till they confirmed at length by miracle what I with so much strength of argument resisted, else they feigned. For in the lake where their first spring they gained, as they sat cooling their soft limbs one night, appeared a face, all circumfused with light, and sure they sought, for Ethiops never dream, wherein they might decipher through the stream these words, that they a land must forthwith seek, whose termination of the Greek sounds Tanya, where bright soul that heat their bloods doth never rise or set, but in his journey passeth by and leaves that climate of the sky to comfort of a greater light who forms all beauty and beauty with his sight. In search of this have we three princedoms passed that seek, speak out Tania in their accents last, black Mauritania first, and secondly, swarth Lusitania, next we did descry, rich Aquitania, and yet cannot find the place unto these longing nymphs designed. Instruct and aid me, great Oceanus, what land is this that now appears to us? This land that lifts into the temperate air his snowy cliff is Albion the Fair so called of Neptune's son who ruleth here, for whose dear guard myself four thousand years since old Deucalion's days have walked the round about his empire proud to see him crowned about my waves. 
OK, we'll pause there. There's quite a lot to unpack there um, in terms of uh, all these uh, references to uh, Albion and uh, Tanya. I don't know what, what name, uh, uh, what, 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 what uh, project James might, uh, that might be, uh, of James that might be alluding to there. Um, so, yeah, uh, starting to get a sense of, uh, of what the text is doing here in terms of uh, this, this question of a beauty standard here uh, and, and that these characters are, are, are playing with now. Uh, who wants to leap in? Um, uh, I'll go to Elizabeth and Emily. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to talk briefly about Niger's speech because it's so extensive. Mm. Um, he he gives an authoritative praise of blackness, which raises questions about the degree to which blackness expresses or belies truth about interior states. The first part of Niger's argument is formed in terms of primacy, so it's a constant concept of the first form dames. The second states that the fact that black skin has firm hues, and the third is that black skin is a manifestation of the sun's love. It says signs of his ferventist love. Um, the very fact that dark skin is fixed means it hosts a more honest and true disposition. And in Niger's defense of blackness lies the mask's duplicity. M Niger is often referred to as an anti-mask character. He uses like words like sparkling, refulgent, delight and glorious about brightness and joy and light. Um, and the princes, according to him, are light and bright, not despite their blackness, but because the black skin defines, signifies divine blessing. For Niger, his daughter's blackness is a reason for them to be even more beautiful rather than to be considered less. But it's actually them that looking into the pool and are, are be made aware of their blackness that l lament it. And it's um, it's interesting because lots of character, lots of um, academics see Niger as this kind of foolish character, as a character who doesn't seem to understand um, the nature of the of the ugliness or the 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 unappealingness of blackness. Um, and um, I don't know if we've done this line yet, um, Rob. Poor brain sick men style poets here with you have with such envy of their graces sung, which have poisoned the minds of the princesses and made them weep such ceaseless tears. Because they start to weep and they start to lament their blackness. And so it's just a it's just a kind of a controversial, full of contradiction text, especially Niger speeches. Because he is this high status character and he's painted black the same way Oceanus is painted blue. So it's not just the painting of blackface in this text. It's also, you know, blue face as well. Um, and maybe perhaps green. Mm. Uh, and yet yeah, uh, for, for those who were just mentioning uh, anti-mask there, this this idea of uh, uh, of within a, a mask you might have a, a an outsider figure or outsider things coming in uh, into the text who may contradict what the the central thesis of the uh, of the text is so there's opposition uh, potentially in play here ben jo i'm just for the future reference there's quite a lot to say on that um because ben johnson effectively uses three slightly different but almost exactly the same terms um and uses them in subtle ways um so uh, and, and it feeds off earlier mask things to do with in people interrupting uh, stuff so um but yeah absolutely that the, the the what what niger and Ozea, what this disc this uh almost debate you could say that's going on between oceanus and niger what that's doing uh emily uh i saw earlier and then lois i think um i <laughs> i feel rather silly talking about um the poetry after that but um but it's it's so interesting to read this on the tongue because um it's so smooth it's been um it reminds me that i i have been reading um a lot of lesser poets speaking the words of a lot of lesser poets um so as much oh, as johnson oh, we, may not we, like we, being we don't called... use the word lesser poets sorry lesser uh <laughs> thank you i'm sorry 
Um, your poet. Reading, reading other poets who require more work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Some people really skirt the edge of what gets edited out here. Uh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. Please take no, it. Right. Take I'm it joking. out. I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, but uh, but at the same time, I found that because everything is so regular in this tetrometer that, um, well, A, I think it must have been very easy to memorize and very easy to speak. So uh, that's helpful for the people who are taking this on. Um, but it's also uh, very lulling. So in a way, uh, you end up sort of, as someone said, dreamlike earlier, you end up sort of getting vague images, but it's not it's actually not necessarily employing my critical thought in the same way that sometimes other poetry does. Um, and I wonder, therefore, since you're in this sort of lulled dreamlike state and with the, the imagery and everything happening, um, that there may be room for the audience to bring whatever they are thinking or feeling to the mask in perhaps a less critical way. Um, I, I don't know, but it's it's just it's interesting text because it is so smooth and has a different effect than other um, other pieces, perhaps with sprung rhythm might have. Mm. Um, yeah, and and we've we, just to, to go back to before we even get to uh, text, you know, we have more of this description of display. You know, we've got gi giant concave shells, we've got huge sea monsters with torchbearers, right? Uh, you know, we we we've we've got all of these elements that uh and it's this description of and in the chat a lot of people were talking about uh you know inigo and jones or almost going you know yeah you, you are going to mention me aren't you you you, you, you <laughs> are you are going to mention me um yeah it's called perspective mate perspective um you know <laughs> prospective yeah person yeah anyway um so the, the the and the idea of lulling that that that's that's interesting what if it effect is this looking to have uh what what's the effect uh of all this um uh, that's i yeah uh lois was next then helen and then we will need to move on said that oh briefly alan as well yeah there's a lot of stuff to say about this and i don't know if you really want it all to come in at this point uh i mean the uh, the torchbearers are terribly important. I mean, they're personal spotlights, really, for each of the, the maskers. Um, and of course, you know, it, it, this thing was being given at night and it's entirely by candlelight. And anybody who's seen productions of the Wanamaker can see how quite a lot of the actors there are essentially using something like torches or, or lanterns that are shining on their faces so you can see them. It's kind of that, that effect. Um, but the other thing, um, I think this is actually rather unusual in masks and that I wouldn't have said it has an anti-mask and I don't know if you want to get into that, but I mean, the anti-mask is usually something completely opposed to the mask, whereas mm. the maskers appear at the beginning and uh, uh, what Niger's talking about is, I mean, he's totally fond of his daughters and thinks they're beautiful, but they unfortunately have got the wrong idea and they've partly got it from poets who have made up this myth about how they were all white once and then Phaeton when he fell from the sky, uh, you know, from driving the chariot of the sun, sort of uh, turned them black because of uh, the, the flames being too hot. So now, of course, the girls, having bought into this myth, are are terribly depressed. I mean, both there there are really two kinds of myth about blackness. I mean, one is the one about constancy, taking no other hue, uh, not blushing, not not going dark. I mean, not going white haired. You know, the I mean, the whole thing being constant state and then the other is this thing that somehow it's the result of something that happened uh, you know that it's whiteness that has somehow t been burned or dirtied or something and you've got them both really side by side but uh, but niger is totally sympathetic to his daughters and i can't see how he can really be a either a comic character or or wrong about anything i mean uh and the, but the women unfortunately have got this idea that they've got to go to some place ending in tania and uh that they will be transformed and that's where we've got to now mm. um and yeah i i think the thing is also we should pace ourselves a little bit with mask you know the, 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 there's a temptation at this stage because we haven't really done any before just let's say everything now yeah, yeah, um, I know. <laughs> you know, we, we, we we can come back to this and we you know and uh, another for another session uh when we're perhaps more in the know and uh and the, the, there's 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 a lot that we can we can still do further down the line so d don't panic uh about getting everything in uh at this stage helen uh, yes, I was somewhat worried about what Emily said, because um, 
having read Niger, um, admittedly cold, I was, uh, I found it very difficult. I, I found the, the sentence structure horrible. I found the endless parentheses uh, very difficult to get a grip on. And I, I'm very grateful to Lois for explaining to me what I was actually saying. So I, I, I don't, I mean, yes, it reads, and yes, the meter is fairly uh, insistent, which is very helpful. But I can tell you this, without somebody's have very helpful punctuation, I would have been so lost. Uh, I'll briefly go to Alexandra and then I'll go to Alan, then we'll move on. Uh, something entirely unrelated to what's just been, been discussed, but to what we were discussing earlier, I've just done a little bit of research and there is a prevalent myth of the River Niger being the same as the River Nile, which is the river of Ethiopia, because of course it is. And so the idea that it's flowing from one end of the continent to the other one was um, either factual or considered very likely to be true, uh, would have been at the time. Excellent. So uh, there's a little bit of, a, of of description of that in um, before Niger speaks. Uh, Alan, yeah, a couple of questions which aren't directly related to the text we just covered. One, would the actors in this have been um, professionals or would have they been civilians? The other issue is we know that it was uh, presented at the Palace of Whitehall. Now. I think the major room in that palace, which is the only bit of it which actually survives, the banqueting house, but I'm not sure whether the present building would actually have been in place at that time or whether it was constructed slightly later. It post-dates. It's, it's very, it is, it is slightly later. Um, right. Uh, and and uh, uh, the, the, uh, um, I don't know the domain. Actually, it's a good question. Actually, when earlier saying how many people would see this, I mean, actually, just uh, someone surely knows what the dimensions of the space was. So we actually, you could, you could, you could, uh, we could actually have a reasonable guesstimate as how many people you would pack in. You know, if, um, if you're looking at the current banqueting house, you could quite easily get an audience of two or three hundred in there mm. without problem. Yeah, depending on how much space many you need more. for the mechanics. Mm. Um, uh, Lois, uh, briefly. Yes, sorry. Well, the Banqueting House has these wonderful paintings by Rubens, doesn't it? And uh, uh, I think it was actually finished under Charles the First because it shows the, the, on the ceiling the apotheosis of James the First after his death. But uh, there was uh, Charles was so bothered that the smoke from the torches would ruin the paintings that he didn't, in fact, use it for masks. Uh, so they kept on doing them wherever they'd been doing them. Uh, yes, and as to the performers, uh, there are some uh, the, the, there are uh, some texts that feature uh, actual professional actors coming in and, and doing professional text. Um, the, the 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 in this specifically in this, we're going to get to it in a moment uh, about who some of the maskers were in terms of people who were dancing, um, and uh, and sometimes uh, and sometimes the the text is performed uh, by members of the court in terms of speaking text, but not necessarily very well, because that that's not necessarily good form. Um, uh, that there's there's all sorts of uh, uh, questions about that. I, I don't know if Elizabeth wanted to follow up on the, on that or other things before we move on. Yeah, Rob, I just wanted to um, follow up on what you just said. It was um, critics are not really clear about the social status of the actor who may have played Niger in performance, but um, whether it was a professional actor or a member of the nobility. But it was common for professionals to be included in casts of courtly masks in the period, especially for speaking parts. But the performers were usually aristocrats or high status gentry. Mm. I would say we'll get, we'll get a sense of who the dancers were in, in a little bit and all who were standing there in costumes doing standy things um, <laughs> uh, as, as the, they will do. But we do need to complete the text. We're running very, very behind schedule, which is fine. Uh, uh, that, that is cool. Uh, Alexandra, I'll ask you to need the next uh, bit of prose. Um, uh, if we'll keep the uh, Oceanus and Niger as well. Uh, Elizabeth, if you could read Ethiopia. Uh, and then uh, uh, Lois, if you can read the uh, bit of prose here, the Tritons sounded uh, there, then uh, we, we will briefly pause, but we'll, we'll move on pretty quickly after that. And I'll ask Alan if you can be first echo, just to key you up there. And Eric, if you could be second echo. You want me um, to read that whole table? No, well, we, we may pause briefly to, <laughs> oh, okay. to mention it, but uh, it, I, I'm suspecting we just don't have time to do the kind of stuff I was going to do with that table. Um, coming up. 
Uh, oh, so... but the table's so cool. I know, I know. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll, 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 I'll play it by ear. I'll play it by ear. Uh, let's get to the table. So uh, Alexandra, um, uh, followed by uh, Helen, followed by uh, Elizabeth, followed by Lois, and then we'll briefly pause before we move forward. At this, the moon was discovered in the upper part of the house, triumphant in a silver throne made in figure of a pyramid. Her garments white and silver, the dressing of her head antique, and crowned with a luminary or sphere of light, which striking on the clouds and heightened with silver, reflected, as natural clouds do, by the splendor of the moon. The heaven about her was vaulted with blue silk and set with stars of silver which had in them their several lights burning, the sudden sight of which made Niger to interrupt Oceanus with this present passion. O oh, sea, our silver star, whose pure auspicious light greets us thus far. Great Ethiopia, goddess of our shore, since with particular worship we adore thy general brightness, let particular grace shine on my zealous daughters. Show the place which long their longings urge their eyes to see. Beautify them which long have deified thee. Niger, be glad, resume thy native cheer. Thy daughter's labours have their period here, and so thy errors. I was that bright face reflected by the lake in which thy race read mystic lines, which skill Pythagoras first taught to men by a reverberate glass. This blessed isle doth with that tania end, which where they saw inscribed and shall extend, wished satisfaction to their best desires, Britannia, which the triple world admires. This isle hath now recovered for her name, where reign those beauties that with so much fame the sacred muses sons have honoured, and from bright Hesperus to Aeus spread. With that great name Britannia, this blessed isle hath won her ancient dignity and style a world divided from the world, and tried the abstract of it in his general pride. For were the world with all his wealth a ring Britannia, whose name name makes all tongues sing, might be a diamond worthy to enchase it, ruled by a sun that to his height doth grace it, whose beams shine day and night and are a force to blanch an Ethiop, and revive a course. His light sciential is, and past mere nature, can salve the rude defects of every creature. Call forth thy honored daughters then, and let them for the Britain men, indent the land with those pure traces they flow with in their native graces. Invite them boldly to the shore, their beauty shall be scorched no more. This sun is temperate and refines all things on which his radiance shines. Here the tritons sounded and they danced on shore, every couple as they advanced severally presenting their fans, in one of which were inscribed their mixed names, in the other a mute hieroglyphic expressing their mixed qualities, uh, which manner of symbol I rather chose than impraise, as well for strangeness as relishing of antiquity, and more applying to that original doctrine of sculpture, which the Egyptians are said first to have brought from the Ethiopians. And yes, so at this point in the uh, text, we have a, a little table uh, with the various performers at this point um, uh, working uh, from the Queen, uh, uh, Anna, uh, down uh, through uh, various uh, courtiers. And here's where we hit the sort of soap opera element of uh, of this, as uh, the, we, we, we can uh, actually apply biography to these performers in, in quite detailed ways. We probably don't have time to do that here. Um, but there is uh, that element there. Should be noted, the Queen is quite pregnant at this point um, as well. 
So uh, there, there is there is an awful lot here to be said about uh, uh, performing bodies uh, at this point. But um, yeah, we, we, we have uh, details in the text here of what's on the fans in terms of the uh, uh, what their, uh, uh, their their names represent and also a symbol uh, there. So we've golden tree and crystal and uh, naked feet in a river. Um, and 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 all sorts of uh, imagery uh, that's going with these uh, these uh, these, uh, uh, these 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 performers. And as Lois said earlier, that question of uh, the, the, their their spotlight, their personal spotlights, uh, entered the stage earlier, so uh, that they could be uh, reasonably uh, well lit as well. Uh, any thoughts while we're briefly paused here on 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 where this is going? We, we've got much more explicitly stated the thesis of the text as it were uh of this um you need to go to britannia they've said it it's like they've been they've been tantalizing us with anya uh <laughs> tanya um oh, and and now the explicitly stating um uh the, the 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 really problematic element of the text um does anyone have anything they want to throw in now or shall we uh, rattle on to the end elizabeth I just wanted to focus on two lines. The first one was to Blanche in Ethiop and revive a course. And the second one is the sun is temperate and refines all things on which his radiance shines. And of course, the sun will be James. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, Ethiopia here is, is, is a, is a uh, goddess of the moon. Uh, you know, this, this, and this, this, this description here we've got of all the white and the colour uh, presumably designed to reflect as much of the torchlight as you can. And uh, well, Helen, you were saying earlier about the colours that, uh, that that work best under. Uh, so that is that 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 logic. Um, White carnation and a sort of sea green. Yeah. So uh, yeah, and explicitly it's stating here uh, the sort of colours and, and reflective surfaces that they're able to do here uh, for the moon. Look at the moon. Um, but these be but toys. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, yes, we have uh, various lists of names here, so we will skip through. So uh, the names of the Oceane, um, Doris, etc. Um, uh, so I'll ask Alexandra, could you read uh, the next bits of uh, sort of text and song just to, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, lead us in? And then uh, if I could ask, uh, say, Alan to be first echo and Eric to be second echo. Uh, and then once they finished echoing, Emily, if you could do the same for the end of the, uh, the, the text as well. So a bit of prose, song, a bit of prose. And we'll get to the end of the text. Um, so shall I skip the bit of text that says the names of the Oceania? Oh, yeah, yeah. Their, their, their own single dance ended. So some dancing's occurred. Very with, good. Um, with the ladies of the court. It, if if I may, just before uh, we go, I, I had a, I, on the names, I had one little thing to say, which was that the queen's name, if she's pregnant, is very interesting because the queen's character's name is Euphoris, which is good carrier. Um, gee, I wonder what that means. So their own single dance ended as they were about to make choice of their men. One from the sea was heard to call them with this charm, sung by a tenor voice. Come away, come away, we grow jealous of your stay. If you do not stop your ear, we shall have more cause to fear. Sirens of the land than they, to doubt the sirens of the say. See, here they danced with their men, several measures, and corantos, all which ended, they were again excited to see with a song of two trebles whose cadences were iterated by a double echo from several parts of the land. So someone would be one of the two or both of them together would be singing daughters of the subtle flood. Let not do not let earth longer entertain you. Let earth longer entertain you. Longer entertain you. Just two of them enough of good that you give this little hope to gain you. Give this little hope to gain you. Little hope to gain you. If they love, you shall quickly see you, for when to flight you move, they'll follow you the more you flee. Follow you the more you flee. The more you flee, if not imputed to each to others matter, they are but earth. But earth. Earth, and what you vowed was water. What you vowed was water. You vowed was water. Enough, bright nymphs. 
the night grows old and we are grieved. We cannot hold you longer light, but comfort take. Your father only to the lake shall make return. Yourselves with feasts must here remain the ocean's guests. Nor shall this veil the sun hath cast above your blood more summers last. For which you shall observe these rites thirteen times thrice on thirteen nights. So often as I fill my sphere with glorious light throughout the year, you shall, when all things else do sleep, save your chaste thoughts with reverence steep, your bodies in that purer brine and wholesome dew called rosmarine. Then with that soft and gentler foam of which the ocean yet yields some, whereof bright Venus, beauty's queen, is said to have begotten been, you shall your gentler limbs all lave, and for your pains perfection have, so that this night, the year gone round, you do again salute this ground, and in the beams of yon bright sun, your face is dry, and all is done. At which, in a dance, they returned to sea, where they took their shell, and with this full song went out. Now Dian with her burning face declines apace, by which our waters know, to ebb that late did flow. Back seas, back nymphs, but with forward grace, keep still your reverence to the place, and shout with joy of flavor, you have won in sight of Albion, Neptune's son. So ended the first mask, which, beside the singular grace of music and dances, had the success in the nobility of performance, as nothing needs to the illustration but the memory by whom it was personated. And yes, indeed, that ends the first mask uh, but the thing with this sequence we've just done is this is potentially a really long sequence because we've got lots of dances uh we've got these lengthy bits with dancing with the men several measures and carantos which you know in a sense is perhaps the primary display function for this text the, the, the queen and her entourage of con on they're going to do some dancing um and uh, and we have what it, i really love the echo structure to the song there I, I think that's that's really nicely done that each is sort of following on and picking up the other line as a thing to set up the next one I'm, I'm sure musicians out there will be able to tell us that that's the thing that you know people have done for ages and there's lots of examples uh, but I was still tickled um, by it uh, uh, and and so there's 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 a lot going on um, thoughts from the room um, Uh, I'll go to Emily, then Alan. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, just thinking about the echo part. I love it. I love it. Um, because uh, it does, it, it was probably, it was definitely sung. Um, and that would have sounded absolutely lovely with the two voices going back and forth. But what I love is that the repetition changes sentences from invitations to demands, things like that. So um, do not let earth longer entertain you. Let earth longer entertain you, longer entertain you. Um, uh, let's see, that you give this little hope to gain you, give this little hope to gain you, little hope to gain you, and then so on. So if you kind of go through it, every time you get to an echo, um, it's not echoing. It's actually manipulating um, the emotional energy. <laughs> and that's just so exciting, particularly because this is, you know, just so uh, mythological that my thought goes, of course, to Narcissus and Echo and how Echo had to speak whatever Narcissus said and would, would try to basically just find her voice by only perhaps, you know, he'd look at himself and he'd go, I love you. And she would say, love you or I, and how that, that alters things. So um, I'm rather thrilled 
by this echo section. Um, and I, I probably, if I were in there, would have been living for the song and dances. Um, so anyway, because, you know, everyone, everyone enjoys a musical. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very briefly additional thoughts. I am going to railroad everyone into moving straight on uh, in a moment. Eric, I saw a hand. Yeah, I was just wondering about the the actual meaning of the words because it's like if they love, you shall quickly see. For when to flight you move, they'll follow you. The more you flee, is that a reference to Echo or something else? Because I'm I'm very very confused with this whole like what what on earth they're talking about. I mean, I know it's just song lyrics, but it's never just song lyrics, especially with Johnson. I uh, uh Lois. Well, I think it's. It's got to do with the with the dancers and and I think the the, the general idea that uh, uh, women run away from men, men follow them, and uh, uh, and if uh, and that we, you can only catch women by pretending you don't want them. I mean, it's it's I think it's that paradox really, uh, and I think that just refers to the um, the dancing. Um, mm. The rest of the plot, I think, it's pointing forward to the next mask. Uh, mm. I think Johnson's idea may have been that, or maybe Queen Anne's idea may have been that they would actually be transformed and at the end of this, but somebody must have pointed out that there was just no way they could go off stage and do a complete uh, face washing and come back again. And so instead the uh, Ethiopia explains that they've got to go away for a year and then come back. Yeah, I mean that that that's a, a a point. I think we uh, said this off camera the other day. Um, the yeah the the, the the um yeah the the practicalities uh, of this question of and the play uh, the the masters not uh, fully resolve this uh, this uh, this story. That's why we're going to ca carry on straight now. Um, and uh, yes, uh, having. Uh, a, a conclusion. Uh, the, the, the 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 it was. It does seem that it was intended that the the the, uh, the second marks were about to do was was to be performed, uh, but it seems to have got gazumped in some fashion uh, for, for an, a specific wedding entertainment instead. Um, so it might be that it was down to practical reasons. It might be just simply no. Uh, the lads wanted to do something else because uh, the other one seems to be a mostly male pursuit um, uh, from uh, other uh, material. Uh, anyway, um, uh, Elizabeth uh, may pick me up on some things there. I don't know. Uh, Elizabeth. Very briefly, I'm going to be as quick as possible. Um, I know that some of us were really interested in the geography of the Tania, the Sounds Tania places. And mm. um, Black Mauritania is uh, a Moorish part of North Africa. Swarth Lusitania is uh, uh, Portugal. Then rich Aquitania was the south of France before the arrival in Britannia. And I wanted to just state that um, the, 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 the ending of the mask shows how political the function was of this. And it was all about monarchical rule. Um, um, some arguments have been that the, the mask of blackness was used to honor the Spanish ambassador who was seated by the king and invited to dance publicly with Queen Anna. Um, they were, the Stuarts were definitely um, showing that they were monarchs to be reckoned with and drawing attention to themselves and in a really powerful way, which is then obviously augmented by the Mask of Beauty. Mm. Uh, so uh, regardless of whether it was intended to follow on directly, uh, it doesn't reappear for a, uh, for a few years till 1608. Uh, the Mask of uh, Blackness, um, we've mentioned uh, Dudley Carlton uh, writes uh, 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 an, uh, an account of the uh, the instance. I'll just briefly close this section with that. Um, the Mask at Night requires much labour to be well described, but there's a pamphlet in the press that will save me that pains. Um, the presentation of the Mask at the, uh, the first drawing of the Traverse was very fair and their apparel rich, but too light and courtesan-like. Their black faces and hands, which were painted and bare up to the elbows, was a very loathsome sight, and I am sorry that strangers should see our court so strangely disguised. Uh, he goes on to talk about the Spanish and Venetian ambassadors, and but that there was a lot of confusion, um, uh, so great that some ladies uh, lie by it and complain of the fury of the white staffs. 
In the passages through the galleries, they were shut up in several heaps betwixt doors, and there stayed till all was ended. And in the coming out, a banquet which was prepared for the king was overturned, table and all, uh, and uh, there was great losses of chains, jewels, purses, and such like. So there was there was quite a there was quite a kerfuffle at this particular uh, uh, event, uh, and it looks like there were just too many people, and they just didn't have enough people on the doors. Uh, to, uh, to keep that going. There is other material, but sadly, I just don't have time and we really want to, I really want to try and rattle through the mask which was of beauty. So I'm going to ask Alan if you could read the opening paragraphs. There are three. Uh, Lois, if you could be Boreas. Uh, Emily, uh, Januarius. <coughs> um, and Eric, if you can be a Volturnus. And then we'll probably briefly pause. So uh, once again, there are maskers in this, uh, many from the uh, the, the, the court uh, and uh, uh, Anna's entourage. Uh, so we've got the Queen once again um, uh, and various others who will be appearing at some point. But this is the second mask, which was of beauty, was presented in the same court at Whitehall on the Sunday night after Twelfth Night, 1608. Two years being now past, that Her Majesty had intermitted these delights, and the third almost come. It was Her Highness' pleasure again to glorify the court, and command that I should think of some fit presentment, which should answer the former, still keeping the same persons, the daughters of Niger, but their beauties varied according to promise, and their time of absence excused, excused with four more added to their number. To which limits, when I adapted my invention, and being to bring news of them from the sea, I induced Boreas, one of the winds, as my fittest messenger, presenting him thus. In a robe of russet and white mixed, full and bagged, his hair and beard rough and horrid, his wings grey and full of snow and icicles, his mantle borne from him with wires, and in several puffs his feet ending in serpent's tails, and in his hand a leafless branch laden with icicles. But before, in midst of the hall, to keep the state of the feast and season, I had placed January in a throne of silver, his robe of ash colour, long, fringed with silver, a white mantle, his wings white, and his buskins, in his hand a laurel bough, upon his head an anademe of laurel, fronted with the sign Aquarius, and the character, who, as Boreas blustered forth, discovered himself. Which among these is Albion, Neptune's son? What ignorance dares make that question? Would any ask who Mars were in the wars? Or which is Hesperus among the stars? Of the bright planets, which is Sol? Or can a doubt arise among creatures which is man? Behold, whose eyes do dart Promethean fire throughout this all, whose precepts do inspire the rest with duty, yet commanding cheer, and are obeyed more with love than fear. What power art thou that thus informest me? Dost thou not know me? I too well know thee by thy rude voice, that dost so hoarsely blow, thy hair, thy beard, thy wings o'er hilled with snow, thy serpent feet, to be that rough north wind, Boreas, that to my reign art still unkind. I am the prince of months, called January. Because by me Janus the year doth vary, shutting up wars, proclaiming peace and feasts, freedom and triumphs, making kings his guests. To thee then thus, and by thee to that king that doth thee present honours, do I bring present remembrance of twelve Ethiop dames, who, guided hither by the moon's bright flames to see his brighter light, were to the sea enjoined again, and thence assigned a day for their return, were in the waves to leave their blackness and true beauty to receive. Which they received, but broke their day, and yet, 
have not returned a look of grace for it, showing a coarse and most unfit neglect. Twice have I come in pomp here to expect their presence, twice deluded, have been fain with other rites my feasts to entertain, and now the third time turned about the year, since they were looked for and yet are not here. It was nor will nor sloth that caused their stay, for they were all prepared not by their day, and with religion forward on their way. When Proteus, the grey prophet of the sea, met them, and made report how other four of their black kind, whereof their sire had store, faithful to that great wonder, so late done upon their sisters by bright Albion, had followed them to seek Britannia forth, and there to hope like favour as like worth which knight envied, as done in her despite, and mad to see an Ethiop washed white, thought to prevent in these, lest men should deem her colour, if thus changed, of small esteem. And so, by malice and her magic, tossed the nymphs at sea as they were almost lost, till on an island they by chance arrived, that floated in the main, where yet she'd jived them so in charms of darkness, as no night, no might should lose them hence, but their changed sister's sight. Whereat the twelve in piety moved and kind, straight put themselves in act the place to find, which was the night's sole trust they so will do, that she with labor might confound them too. For ever since, with error, hath she held them wandering in the ocean, and so quelled their hopes beneath their toil, as desperate now of any least success unto their vow, not knowing to return to express the grace wherewith they labor to this prince and place. One of them, meeting me at sea, did pray that for the love of my Orithiae, whose very name did heat my frosty breast and make me shake my snow-filled wings and crest, to bear this sad report, I would be one and frame their just excuse, which here I have done. Wouldst thou has not begun, unlucky wind, that never yet bluest goodness to mankind, but with thy bitter and too piercing breath, strikes horrors through the air as sharp as death. And here a second wind came in, Volturnus, in a blue-coloured robe and mantle, puffed as the former, but somewhat sweeter. His face black, and on his head a red sun, showing he came from the east, his wings of several colours, his buskins white and wrought with gold. All horrors vanish, and all name of death, be all things here as calm as is my breath. A gentle wind, the Volturnus brings you news, the isle is found, and that the nymphs you now use, they, they rest in joy. The night's black charms are flown, for being made unto their goddess known, bright Ethiopia, the silver moon, as she was Hecate, she break them soon. And now, by virtue of their light and grace, the glorious isle wherein they rest takes place of all the earth for beauty. There their queen hath raised them a throne that still is seen to turn unto the motion of the world, wherein they sit and are, like heaven, whirled about the earth, whilst to them contrary, following those nobler torches of the sky, a world of little loves and chaste desires do light their beauties whilst with still moving fires. And who to heaven's consent can better move than those that are so like it, beauty and love? Hither, as to their new Elysium, the spirits of the antic Greeks are come. Poets and singers, Linus, Orpheus, all that have excelled in knowledge musical, where set in arbors made of myrtle and gold, they live again these beauties to behold, and thence, in flowery mazes walking forth, 
sing hymns in celebration of their worth. Whilst to their songs two fountains flow, one height of lost in youth, the other chaste to light, at, that at the closes from their bottom spring and strike the air to echo what they sing. But why do I describe what all must see? By this time near the coast, they floating be. For so their virtuous goddess, the chaste moon, told the, the fate of the island should and soon would fix itself onto thy continent, as being the place by destiny poor men, where they should flow forth dressed in her attires, and that the influence of these holy fires, first wrapped from hence, being multiplied upon the other four, should make their beauties one which now expect to see great Neptune's son and love the miracle which thyself has done. And there we'll pause. So basically that's uh, previously on the mask of uh, uh, re reiterating uh, where we were before. I, I, uh, January being quite annoyed, you know, I, 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 this is the third time. If I'm getting stood up again, uh, I'm going to get very, very, very cross. <laughs> Uh, and he's talking about the you know the other rights my feats to entertain so the rival masks that got produced instead of, of instead of this they get, kept getting bumped. Uh, I'm I'm not saying that Ben Johnson is bitter uh, at at any point, but uh, one it's like with civic pageantry you do, do keep noticing that there's the possibility that some minor scores are being being s settled here uh, as you go along, even amid something which is uh, verified here. Uh, the description has primarily been of costume uh, so far. We're about to get to descriptions of great display and stuff. Uh, thoughts from the room about this uh, this little sequence, um, where it's leading us on from last time. And so thinking of these effectively as Act 1 and Act 2 might be a, a way to think about it. Um, about, uh, yeah, uh, anyone want to leap in? Uh, Emily. Uh, no, just very briefly, um, I, I haven't gone back to look at where the enjammed versus the end stop lines are. Um, but at least reading Januarius, I was finding that there were more enjambments and that was helping me to make sense of the grammar as Helen was talking about. Um, so, so that might just be some, that's just something interesting that I would love to look further at where it's helpful um, and where it's confusing. Mm. Uh, hello. And then Eric. Yeah, I, I did feel with re listening to that, that the the change in the way we say words, which means that some rhymes are no longer rhymes, was much more apparent in this verse than in ordinary verse that, that, that we've read in other plays. And it struck me that this may be because this is being written for amateurs. To learn to, to to and to speak, and yeah. that because of that, there's there's some good solid lines that can help you remember them. Uh, Lois might want to uh, uh, follow there. I don't think the speech is for amateurs. Uh, I mean, as far as I I know, the first um, amateur actor to speak was the Duke of Buckingham in the uh, the Gypsy's Mask, and I think 1621, and that's presumably because he was. A, he actually wanted to do it and thought he was good. But uh, now I think they use professional singers and professional speakers, uh, often actors from the, you know, the leading theater companies. Um, but uh, they, they, the court were trained in dancing. I mean, they spent ages rehearsing these dances, which were extremely elaborate. And uh, that was supposed to be a sort of sign of aristocratic quality. So, uh, so they certainly did the dances. Although, there, again, there would have been in some performances, I'm not sure about this one, but in others, there would have been professional dancers doing the grotesque stuff. I mean, the really acrobatic dancing. But, uh, uh, but in other words, no, I don't think it was written for amateurs to speak. Mm. Mm. Uh, Eric. Yeah, I was just going to mention the, the description that Volturnus gives. He gives this long description and then goes, well, you should see it yourselves. Uh, but clearly, it's, I don't know, it feels very much like sort of costume change or sort of it's going to take us 10 minutes to set this up therefore and because you never understand my work it's very uh, i'm going to explain it to you in clear not so clear english uh okay let's uh, let's get to that spectacle then uh uh well I'll ask helen if you could do the opening uh chunky 
bit of uh, uh, description. Here a curtain. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and then if I could ask Alexandra to follow and uh, and Elizabeth after, because we basically have a list coming up. And I was going to say Alexandra, uh, then Elizabeth, and then you can go back to Alexandra and then back to Elizabeth and back to Alexandra, if that's, that, that makes sense, if you could alternate. So Helen first, then Alexandra, and then Elizabeth, etc. You will alternate until I tell you to stop. Um, <laughs> and uh, and then we'll we'll shake it all up a bit. Here a curtain was drawn in which the night was painted and the scene discovered, which, because the former was marine and these yet of necessity to come from the sea, I devised should be an island floating on a calm water. In the midst thereof was a seat of state called the Throne of Beauty, erected, divided into eight squares, and distinguished by so many ionic pilasters, as these, in these squares the 16 maskers were placed by couples. Behind them, in the centre of the throne, was a translucent pillar shining with several coloured lights that reflected on their backs from the top of which pillar went several arches to the pilasters that sustained the roof of the throne, which was likewise adorned with lights and garlands. And between the pilasters in front, little cupids in flying posture, waving with wreaths and lights, bore up the coronets, over which were placed eight figures, representing the elements of beauty, which advanced upon the Ionic and being females had the Corinthian order. The first was... Splendor in a robe of flame color, naked breasted, her bright hair loose flowing. She was drawn in a circle of clouds, her face and body breaking thorough and in her hand a branch with two roses, a white and a red. The next to her was... Serenitas, in a garment of bright sky colour, a long tress and waved with a veil of diverse colours, such as the golden sky sometimes shews. Upon her head a clear and fair sun shining, with rays of gold striking down to the feet of the figure. In her hand a crystal, cut with several angles and shadowed with diverse colours as caused by refraction. The third, Germinatio, in green, with a zoni of gold about her waist, crowned with myrtle. Her hair, like, her hair likewise flowing, but of not so bright a colour. In her hand, a branch of myrtle. Her socks of green and gold. The fourth was Letitia, in a vesture of diverse colours, and all sorts of flowers embroidered thereon her socks so fitted, a garland of flowers in her hand, her eyes turning up and smiling, her hair flowing and stuck with flowers. The fifth, temperies in a garment of gold, silver and colours weaved. In one hand she held a burning steel, in the other an urn with water. On her head a garland of flowers, corn, vine leaves and olive branches interwoven, her socks as her garment. The sixth, Venustus, in a silver robe with a thin subtle veil over her hair and it, pearl about her neck and forehead, her socks wrought with pearl. In her hand she bore several coloured lilies. The seventh was Dignitas, in a dressing of state the hair bound up with fillets of gold, and garments rich and set with jewels and gold, likewise her buskins, and in her hand a golden rod. The eighth, Perfectio, in a vesture of pure gold, a wreath of gold upon her head, about her body the zodiac, with the signs, in her hand a compass of gold, drawing a circle. On the top of all, the throne, as being made out of all these, stood Harmonia, a personage whose dressing had something of all the others, and had her robe painted full of figures. 
Her head was compassed with a crown of gold, having in it seven jewels equally set. In her hand, a lyra whereon she rested. And we'll uh, swap readers. Alan, if you could read the next chunky uh, paragraph, please. This was the ornament of the throne, the ascent to which, consisting of six steps, was covered with a multitude of cupids, chosen out of the best and most ingenious youth of the kingdom, noble and others, that were the torchbearers, and all armed with bows, quivers, wings, and other ensigns of love. On the sides of the throne were curious and elegant arbours appointed, and behind, in the back part of the aisle, a grove of grown trees laden with golden fruit, which other little cupids plucked and threw at each other, while on the ground leverets picked up the bruised apples and left them half eaten. The ground plat of the whole was a subtle indented maze, and in the two foremost angles were two fountains that ran continually, the one Hebe's, the other Hestone's. In the harbours were placed the musicians, who represented the shades of the old poets, and were attired in a priest-like habit of crimson and purple, with laurel garlands. Eric, uh, Eric, if you could take up the next few paragraphs, please. Um, sorry, I, I'm a bit confused about where we are, because the there are so many the descriptors. Maskers. The colours of the maskers. Uh, the colours of the maskers were varied. The one in, half in orange, tawny, and silver, the other in sea green and silver. The bodies and short skirts on white and gold to both. The habit and dressing for the fashion was most curious and so exceeding in riches as the throne whereon they sat, sat seemed to be a mine of light struck from their jewels and their garments. This throne, as the whole island moved forward on the water, had a circular motion of its own imitating that which we call motum mundi from the east to the west or the right to the left side. The steps whereon the cupid sat and, and had a motion contrary with analogy ad motum planetarum from the west to the east, <laughs> both which turned with their several lights. And with these three varied motions at once, the whole scene shot itself to the land above which the moon was seen in a silver chariot drawn by virgins to ride in the clouds and hold them greater light, with the sign Scorpio and the character placed before her. The order of the scene was carefully and ingeniously disposed and happily put in act for the motions by the king's master carpenter. The painters, I must needs say not to belie them, <laughs> lent small color to any uh, to attribute much of the spirit of these things to their pencils. That must not be imputed to crime, neither to the invention or the or design. Yes, every so often they just can't resist <laughs> doing this. Uh, it's it's fascinating. In in some of the Lord Mayor shows that they spend an awful lot of time really praising the craftsmanship of the of the work of the people that they collaborate really strongly with, and you just don't get the sense the impression that Ben Johnson's relationship is quite the same here, do you? Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Alan. Is it possibly giving them an on-stage credit is cheaper than paying them the right price? Uh, oh, I suspect they they, they, they they probably got money far quicker than he did. Um, <laughs> uh, Eric. I have a question. It, like, it says, above which the moon was seen in a silver chariot drawn by virgins to ride in the clouds. How do we know they're virgins? Does that even matter at this point? <laughs> I'm, sure or is it just like... I'm sure there's <laughs> iconography for that. Um, <laughs> loose hair. Loose hair. You, if you were, if you're a virgin, you wore your hair loose. Yeah, there's a lot of good sock action going on here. A <laughs> lot of detail in the socks. Um, the question of the naked-breasted splendor. Um, yeah. Uh, there, I, 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 I do believe that 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 uh, does happen in other other texts as well. So I don't think that's in, in, entirely an unknown thing. So there's, uh, we were discussing eroticism of uh, a form uh, uh, earlier. So. Um, yeah, what what what's going on here? Thoughts on the room? Because obviously a lot of listing there of of what we're seeing. Uh, a lot of pilasters, always nice stuff. And the sort of that final, the throne, the motion is is it sort of a layer cake with revolving mm. in different directions? Is that how it was? It was Busby uh, Berkeley. Yeah, it's. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, it seems it, it, it's more detailed actually and, and clearer. Uh, I'm not saying it's any less or more. Um, 
display than the last one was, but it sense that I can visualize that in a slightly easier way. Um, Alexandra. Yeah, just 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 to throw a little thing in there about this this construction. I get the feeling this is the part where Inigo Jones went. No, no, no! Don't tell them about that. That we're keeping that bit a secret. The mechanics of how it works. No, 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 no. Mm. Tell them how things looked, but don't tell them how it worked. Yeah, I'm not sure if it, this one was uh, Inigo. I know the last one definitely was. I, I don't know who uh, was actually on this. It, uh, 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 he might have been, uh, uh, but uh, I'm just saying I don't. I can't definitively say that uh, from the data I have in front of me. Someone else, please Google that. Um, uh, yeah. Um, other other thoughts. Um, Seems to have been the work of the King's Master Carpenter, uh, hmm. whoever that was, and he has nothing good to say about the painters. Yeah, I mean that, but that might be the craftsman end of things. I, I don't know uh, uh, how that 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 works. But yeah, it's a good it's a good uh, yeah uh, that he he has a different relationship with them. Emily. Uh, yeah, just a quick Google. Apparently, the total cost of producing the mask was four thousand mm pounds -hmm. for this mask. Yeah, and the House of Stewart was running an annual budget deficit of. 140,000 pounds in this era. <laughs> so, so so this is cheap at twice. You know, frankly, when you're in that, when you've dug yourself <laughs> that far, you know, let's have just a party. Just keep going. And, you know, that's just presumably this mask. That doesn't necessarily include other entertainments that were going on during this season of, uh, of entertainments as well. So, yeah, they knew at a party. Uh, Lois again. Yeah, you could spend ages explaining the the iconography of all the the costumes i mean the the symbols the colors and everything i mean he had it all worked out and was very proud of it i mean this is part of what he thought was important about writing a mask was that you really had to look up all of this and find out about the symbolism and what was appropriate to which personification uh so he's really done it and i think i think there are some masks where he's actually done footnotes explaining his sources for all that information mm. yes there are, uh, eric I help but wonder if Thomas Haywood ever actually did one of these because it sounds like something he would have written, like just sort of um, the the whole description of like yes, and it was so perfect and to uh, you know uh, uh, just sort of glorifying himself through through the way he described everything. Um, yeah, but he wouldn't have described the actual ornament on the throne and said there was a throne. I'm, I could describe it for you, but I won't. Yeah, that, that's what Thomas Haywood would have written. It, it was, uh, how do you call it, vulgar entertainment. Yeah, I don't get involved in the dancing side of things. <laughs> <laughs> but here he's actually explicitly saying, I no, I, I devised this. I, I did the devising. He's really clear with the I. And so there's, there's a real authorship stamp going on here. Uh, Emily. Yeah, no, I, I haven't yet found Inigo Jones, you know, and very quick, you know, searching to see whether his name was on it. Um, I think I was taken in by the fact that we got to, um, you know, divided into eight squares, distinguished by onyx pilaster, you know, Corinthian <laughs> order, Trelucent's pillar. It sounded again like this was the paragraph that whoever did the show was like, this is how it worked. This is what it was. I will write this out. Um, but it it is interesting um, that Johnson is kind uh, that Inigo's name isn't on it, so maybe he didn't do it. And Johnson is is perhaps taking credit for things, which would kind of make which kind of flows with what's happening before with even January is going. I couldn't be here for two years, you know. And well, no, I had the idea for the island, <laughs> and it's. It's an interesting flex that's mm. happening in the text. Uh, uh, Lois, and then we will we will uh, go to Eric, and then we will uh, uh, move on. I mean, at the same time, I mean, it's really quite a weird thing to write because you had to start with the fact that Queen Anne, Anne wanted a particular kind of costume. And I think that uh, probably these things all started with somebody commissioning a particular sort of design in general terms. But then he's also got to work in four extra people. I mean, that whole elaborate story that... Uh, uh, that I was telling earlier was uh, to do with the fact that there uh, there were 12 women who arrived in Britain in the uh, previous mosque, and now there are four more that he's got to get into it somehow. And so, you know, he works out this complicated thing and has them on an island, and, you know, it all, it all gets pretty goofy. Yeah, it's just, oh, God, got to four more people. Oh, God, we don't have room. Uh, uh, Eric, then Alexandra. 
I was just going to ask, like, sort of, because this is so elaborate, the whole description of the throne and the ascent of which uh, consisting six steps, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, how on earth? Like, the mu- it says in the arbors were placed the musicians. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what? Wh- where, are the- where are you putting the musicians? What? <laughs> yeah, it just, it's very elaborate. Mm. Uh, Alexander. Yeah, musicians are frequently put up trees. That's that's part of the <laughs> job. Um, yeah. The um, the thing that I wanted to point out is that uh, we have these speeches in between that are presumably uh, part of the of the function uh, is to cover the the not the scene change but the well yes actually the scene change um, the the taking away of whatever setup we had for the first one and the bringing up of the setup for the second one, but also it's a very short time if uh, if that's all. You you have for costume changes and for dragging in an entirely new set um and so yeah i'm wondering wh- how much of a of a break there would have been how much of a, you know what what other i don't know setting up or what other entertainment or how this would have functioned with all of these characters who come on i mean i'm seeing it sort of it's like a, a, a fashion show it's like they, they can't walk on and present you know the, the spectacle and these people processing is 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 half the it is the show, actually. Yeah. You know, we're we're we are perhaps overemphasizing these speeches. You know, that's just throat clearing. Actually, it's just setting the scene for the display that we're going to get. And actually, the absence of the music makes it really hard to unpack because we don't know how much music there is as well that's filling in all the gaps um, and keeping the show together. Uh, Elizabeth. Yeah, I was thinking that compared to the Mask of Blackness, the Mask of Beauty is more more opulent, more expensive. And I think it's a little bit lighter on story. Is that mm. the focus was the the spectacle of this text, definitely. And I do think that Lois was right. They definitely, sh- Johnson shoehorned in those other four <laughs> ladies. Really, you really had to kind of squeeze them into the narrative. Um, I, I do like the character of Janurius and his face all painted black with his red adornments. I think the adornments in this are, were definitely to, to kind of say, oh, you saw the last one, but you haven't seen anything yet. Mm. Helen. Yes, I think three years on, it would appear that the Britannia bit has been quietly dropped <laughs> because the king has given up. Yeah, has, has, has under, uh, sh- shall we say, some consumer resistance. The project um, of Britain is no more. It was a <laughs> nice idea. Uh, right, we've got uh, what is mostly song uh, and description coming up. Um, so uh, uh, we'll, we'll uh, dance around a bit. Um, but I'll ask um, uh, 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 Eric and uh, Alan to just alternate the echoes that are coming up. Um, they're, they're not labelled. Helen, if you could do some prose stuff uh, coming up um, uh, for for a little while, I'll swap everyone around in a bit. So, uh, will that be which ended Volturnus? Will be my first speech then? Uh, no, they hear the loud music cease. Oh right, got you. Um, and we'll uh, go. Uh, Volturnus remain, whoever Volturnus was, Eric. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I'll uh, I'll say uh, Elizabeth. You could be the first song that comes up. Uh, and then I might swap some people around. Uh, you don't have to sing, but if you want to sing, you know, you can sing. I'm going to go for it because Emily and Rachel have inspired me. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, Helen, take it away. Here the loud music ceased and the musicians which were placed in the arbours came forth through the mazes to the other land, singing this full song, iterated by in the closes by two echoes rising out of the fountains. When love at first did move from out of chaos brightened, so was the world enlightened as now. As now. As now. Yield night then to the light, as blackness hath to beauty, which is but the same duty it was for beauty, that the world was made, and where she reigns, love lights admit no shade. Love's light admit no shade. Admit no shade. 
which ended. Volturnus the wind spake to the river Thamesis that lay along between the shores, leaning upon his urn that flowed with water and crowned with flowers, with a blue cloth of silver robe about him, and was personated by Master Thomas Giles, who made the dances. Rise, aged Thames, and by the hand receive these nymphs within the land and in those curious squares and rounds wherewith thou flowest betwixt the grounds of fruitful Kent and Essex fair that lend, lend thee garlands for thy hair, instruct their silver feet to tread whilst we again to see our fled. With which the winds departed and the river received them into the land by couples and fours, their cupids coming before them. These dancing forth a most curious dance, full of excellent device and change, ended it in the figure of a diamond, and so, standing still, were by the musicians with a second song, <laughs> sung by a loud tenor, <laughs> celebrated. So beauty on the water stood, when love had severed earth from flood. So when he parted air from fire, he did with concord all inspire. And then a motion he them taught, that elder than himself was thought, which thought was yet the child of earth, for love is elder than his birth. The song ended, they danced forth their second dance, more subtle and full of change than the former, and so exquisitely performed as the king's majesty incited first by his own liking to that which all others their present wish required them both again after some time of dancing with the lords, required them both again after some time of dancing with the lords, which time to give them respite was intimated with song, first by a treble voice in this manner. And I'll say that uh, Lois can be the treble voice there. Uh -oh. <laughs> Disaster. Uh, if all these cupids now were blind as is their wanton brother, or play should put it in their mind to shoot at one another, what pretty battle they would make if they their objects should mistake and each one wound his mother. Which was seconded by another treble thus. And we'll say that's Eric. Uh, here goes. Let's <laughs> find the text. It was no policy of court, I'll be the place were charmed to let in earnest or in sport so many loves in armed for say the dames should with their eyes upon the hearts here's been surprised were not the men like harmed to which a tenor answered yes whether gloves or false or straying or beauties nor their beauty weighing but here no such deceit is mixed their flames are pure their eyes are fixed they do not war with different darts but strike a music of like hearts after which songs they danced galliards and corantos, and with those excellent graces that the music appointed to celebrate them showed it could be silent no longer, but by the first tenor admired them thus. And Alexandra, you can be a first tenor. Ever had those that dwell in error foul and hold that women have no soul but seen these move they would have then said women were the souls of men so they do move each heart and eye with the world's soul true harmony here they danced a third most elegant and curious dance and not to be described again by any art, but that of their own footing, which ending in the figure that was to produce the fourth, January from his state saluted them thus. 
that's Emily, yes. Uh, I didn't know whether we were keeping on. All right. <clears throat> your grace is great, as is your beauty, dames. Enough my feasts have proved your thankful flames. Now, use your seat. That seat which was before, though straying, uncertain, floating to each shore, and to whose having every clime laid claim. Each land and nation urged as the aim of their ambition, beauty's perfect throne, now made peculiar to this place alone, and by that impulsion of your destinies, and his attractive beams that light these skies, who, though with the ocean encompassed, never wets his hair therein, nor wears a beam that sets. Long may his light adorn these happy rites as I renew them, and your gracious sights enjoy that happiness, even to envy, as when beauty at large break forth and conquered men. At which they dance their last dance into their thrones again, and that, turning the scene, closed with this full song. Which Emily will sing the opening of. It's a full song. Still turn and imitate the heaven in motion swift and even. And as his planets go, your bright lights do show. May youth and pleasure ever flow, but let your state the while be fixed as the isle. So all that see your beauty, beauty sphere see. may know the Elysian fields are here. The Elysian fields are here. Elysian fields are here. So yeah, it goes full musical. I love the fact it's got, and the musicians will play while the dancers recover. Because um, <laughs> they're really tired. Um, uh, but yeah, it just it just goes full song and dance. Um, and we've sort of lost the thread of, you know, what this is all about, um, which is possibly... Po to all our relief to quietly <laughs> uh, uh, move away from that. Um, but yeah, all of the issues that were, were set up in the, the, the previous play, uh, Mask uh, sequence, um, is, 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 is still in, in play in, in, a, in a visual dimension here. So uh, we, we should be careful about enjoying our singing, uh, not to actually uh, uh, remember what the text is actually doing. Um, so yeah, thoughts in the room. We, we are actually well into extra time, so we're just going to talk for as long as we talk and then stop. I won't be going round and, and things. So uh, you know, if people need to disappear, then that's fine. <laughs> Helen, then Emily. Uh, am I right in saying that the king called for an encore halfway through that ending? So, in fact, what he's saying is, you know, there was this plan, but the king liked one of the dances so much that it was immediately reprised. I'm not sure if it was immediately reprised. I mean, that may be the bit that where they had the rest, uh, because. Uh, uh, but the, yeah, this this did sometimes happen. I mean, it. it uh, uh, yeah. Or, or yeah, perhaps they were so shattered by having to do the whole thing twice. Yeah, so they went to the band. <laughs> Can you do a song here while the, everyone rests, and we'll do it again in a minute? Because so, the end does feel a bit random at times. That you know, mm. the, the number of dances may be variable. That actually, the, um, mm. the you know, before we get to the summing up, closing uh, moment, you know, because of course this is this is part. The point is to have a bit of an ease up. Um, so, mm. yeah, uh, Lois, did you have more thoughts on that? Well, uh, I mean, I think this is where it turns into the revels, isn't it? I mean, the, the, mm. the, the maskers choose partners from the audience and then everybody is dancing. Mm. Uh, and so a lot of the songs are about how, how you feel about the person you're dancing with, I think. Mm. Uh, Emily, and then uh, other thoughts in the room? Just briefly, um, I love the thought that the plot of a piece of theater could be, we're here. We're finally here. Let's bear some breasts and keep singing. <laughs> and, and that's it. I'm like, wh why have I been spending all my time on complicated act structure? I should just do this. Okay. <laughs> learn, learn from your elders. Um, yes. So, but it's also curious because it kind of feels like he sort of threw a bunch, a bit more together than he did the first one. First one feels like maybe he spent a few more nights writing it. This is just my guess. And this one feels a bit like he was like, oh, I'm back. Okay, great. Da, 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 done. Ready to go. 
They like the echo last time. Let's pull it back in. Um, you know, let's. Uh, uh, oh, we need four more people. Well, if I, if, if you're just going to keep throw, lobbing requests at me, I'm just going to throw <laughs> any old stuff together. Uh, it's what you wanted, not me. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So thoughts about uh, the the two texts together, um, and yeah, about w what it's saying, uh, which obviously is 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 uh, you know about the court and about people. Uh, I'll go to Elizabeth and Helen. I think yes. Then Eric. I feel in some ways that the second mask kind of sanitizes the first. Kind of like if you had any problems with the first one, you're definitely gonna like this because this is mostly just singing and dancing and about Albion. So, so it's not got any of the dangerous things from the last one. But they did have a lot of foreign ambassadors there, so I think that it was a big draw last time, and it was a, there was a lot of expectation of this one being bigger. Mm. And you know, because it's the you know, it's sort of hidden in song lyrics that we you know this this thing uh, uh, yield night then to light blackness have to beauty. I mean this 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 standard that light things are are, are are more beautiful than black things that the the text is 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 playing with and because it's sort of hidden in all the 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 the, the, the dancing and the, and and the stuff that we you know and socks and the distractions that we've allowed <laughs> ourselves to. Uh, to get lured by, um, you know, what what this is presenting is 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 in many ways more of a problem than than we were having with the uh, mask of blackness actually, because we we're sort of able to engage with what that text was directly doing in a much more apparent way. Uh, Helen, yeah, what struck me was the what must have happened with a very very collaborative nature of this, because I mean, from the sock knitters up to the carpenters, the musicians, the people who wrote the music, the people who rehearsed the dances, everybody must have been, uh, well, I don't know, fighting it out or, or, or collaborating like mad, but it, it must have been um, a tremendous collaborative uh, work. I mean, I've no doubt there was stuff in the Revel stores that could be brought out and reviewed, but an awful lot of stuff must have been made and devised fresh. And there are fountains. I mean, you've got to have a hydraulics engineer in there somewhere. Mm. Um, I mean, everybody, there's, there's water coming out of um, so it's got to go somewhere. I mean, one of the things about water is you don't just pour it. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, it's uh, we so know, complex, uh, you know, and that's uh, the 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 point where we're talking about the River Thames, and uh, you know, personated by some uh, Master Thomas Giles, uh, who made the dances. So you know, we we again we're getting names of who people are and and and, and what they're doing. Whereas you don't get the, the it doesn't bother naming the King's Master Carpenter. No, no, no. It, it <laughs> obviously likes Thomas Giles. They probably get on well. They probably drink drink a, in, uh, together or something. I don't know. I'm making that up. Ig ignore all that. I'm just saying words. Uh, yeah, um, I say normally I'd sort of be uh, pushing, you know, how would we stage it? What would it, uh, which we don't have to do. So that's that's fine. Uh, Eric. I was going to say that the second one reminds me, I don't know if you've ever been to a Kaylee, but it's very much like a Kaylee where you've got like instructions kind of in, embedded in the song lyrics kind of thing. Um, although half the time you can't hear them. So you've got to rehearse beforehand or end up colliding with your partner and pretty much everyone else. Um, whereas the first one seems like, yes, this is a political play slash agenda disguised as a mask, um, which is quite interesting contrast over two years. Mm. Uh, Alan? Yeah, just following up on Eric's point there, the trouble with most Cayley calling is that people don't know the left from the right. And counting to four is definitely a problem. Mm. I think part of the problem I've had with this whole thing is there's so much of it which is spectacle. I've sort of lost track of what the words were doing, if anything, particularly meaningful, um, mm. because it just didn't land with me um, because we spent so much time with descriptions of the, the settings and all the rest of it. And certainly when I was reading bits of it, I was actually thinking the voice of the guidebook from under Milk Wood was a rather sniffy um, description. 
Mm. Uh, yeah, I mean, and, and say, in a sense, the description is 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 the is the event. I, I think that it, uh, it, we, you have to think of it in reverse. Um, mm. That we've got to unpick it. I mean, it's little details. You know, the the the, uh, the grove of trees, golden fruit, where p- p- cupids pluck and throw at each other, and then other people pick up and 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 leverets. And... Mm? leverets. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, leverets. Yeah. A baby hair. Mm. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, quite. They're yeah. not. You can't rehearse them. <laughs> <laughs> may, may, maybe the smallest children in the chapel. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to say. Yeah, the, 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 I'm going to yeah. go with costumes. Then in funny <laughs> costumes. Funny costumes. Which again, it's just sort of out of many of our nightmares. I'm sure. Um, yeah. It's, Where's uh, the rabbit? Yeah, uh, <laughs> Lois. Yeah, well, I mean, if anybody's seen productions of the Magic Flute, I mean, this is, seems to me it's that kind of thing, you know, uh, beautiful music and then all sorts of lovely magic effects and uh, uh, some of them mechanical and some people in costume. And, yeah, I think you can get the, the idea. I mean, the mask is kind of what opera comes out of, uh, uh, you know, a, a multimedia uh, entertainment. And most of the early operas had very little story anyway. Mm. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think, I mean, the second one seems to me in, in terms of story or whatever it's doing, quite boring, but I'm sure that for those who saw it, it was probably better than the first one because there was even more spectacle and more dancing. And, uh, you know, it was probably absolutely gorgeous. Hmm. Uh, right. Uh, we will return to more masks and we may return uh, in more detail to some of this or pick up on points on this later. I think this is an ongoing thing especially as we can start putting into context and i think that's always the problem at this stage of uh, we're all scrabbling about a bit just going what's what's a mask and basically the answer to what the what is a mask is it's a thing it's it's a thing it, it's 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 and it's all the things sort of mashed together. So um, on that note, uh, 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 thoughts, uh, additional uh, materials, uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, throw into uh, the links uh, further and on. And uh, we'll be able to get more more, more detail uh, of and understanding as we go. All that remains to thank all the wonderful readers for their wonderful reading. Thank you very much. And goodbye. Bye. Admit no shade.